Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Airbnb's earnings conference call for the fourth quarter of 2022. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded and will be available for replay from the Investor Relations section of Airbnb's website following this call. I will now hand the call over to Ellie Mertz, VP of Finance. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to Airbnb's fourth quarter of 2022 earnings call. Thank you for joining us today. On the call today, we have Airbnb's co-founder and CEO, Brian Chesky, and our Chief Financial Officer, Dave Stevenson. Earlier today, we issued a shareholder letter with our financial results and commentary for our fourth quarter of 2022. These items were also posted on the Investor Relations section of Airbnb's website. During the call, we'll make brief opening remarks and then spend the remainder of time on Q&A. Before I turn it over to Brian, I would like to remind everyone that we will be making forward-looking statements on this call that involve a number of risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially from those expressed or implied in the forward-looking statements due to a variety of factors. These factors are described under forward-looking statements in our shareholder letter and in our most recent filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. We urge you to consider these factors and remind you that we undertake no obligation to update the information contained on this call to reflect subsequent events or circumstances. You should be aware that these statements should be considered estimates only and are not a guarantee of future performance. Also during this call, we will discuss some non-GAAP financial measures. We've provided reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures in the shareholder letter posted to our IR website. These non-GAAP measures are not intended to be a substitute for our GAAP results. And with that, I will pass the call to Brian. All right, well, thank you very much, Ellie, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, before I share results, I wanna tell a quick personal story. As you may have seen, I started hosting again. Last November, I listed my guest room on Airbnb. My listing is called Beyond the Airbed, and the room guests stay in is nostalgically themed around the early years of Airbnb. There's memorabilia in the walls, from the receipt for the original airbed to old photos of me hockling boxes of Obama O's and Captain McCain's breakfast cereal. When guests arrive, I have a welcome basket waiting for them. And the first night we make dinner together, followed by dessert. We bake Chesky's chips, chocolate chip cookies from my cherished family recipe that I got off Google. The next day, we tour the Airbnb offices with my golden retriever, Sophie Supernova, and I tell the story of building Airbnb. Now, why am I doing this? Well, because I love hosting. Joe and I were the first host on Airbnb 15 years ago, and having guests stay in your home with you is the original idea behind Airbnb. It's been an amazing way to connect with people. But I also believe that companies that make the best products make products for themselves. And Airbnb will only be as successful as our host. And the best way to understand our host is to be one. Since I've resumed hosting, I've gotten new firsthand insights that have informed some of the new products we'll be releasing, including some exciting updates this May as part of our 2023 summer release. Now, before we get into our quarterly results, I want to recap the full year of 2022. While we're three years out from the start of the pandemic, we are still living with its impact. And we've also seen high inflation, recessionary fears, and the war in Ukraine, all of which we're still dealing with in 2023. And yet, through all this, people continue to travel. And 2022 was a record year for Airbnb. Revenue of $8.4 billion grew 40% year over year. And when you exclude foreign exchange, our revenue increased by 46% year over year. Net income was $1.9 billion, which marks 2022 as our first profitable year, full year, on a gap basis. And finally, free cash flow was $3.4 billion. And this $3.4 billion of free cash flow represented a free cash flow margin of over 40%. <laughs> Because of our strong balance sheet, we were able to begin buying back stock last year, and we repurchased $1.5 billion in shares in just the past five months. Now, during the height of the pandemic, we made some very difficult choices to reduce our spending, making us a leaner and more focused company. And we've kept this discipline ever since. And over each of the past two years, we've only modestly increased our headcount. In fact, compared to 2019, our headcount is actually down 5%, percent 
while our revenue is up 75%. And every single quarter in 2022 outperformed past comparable periods. In Q4, net income was $319 million. Now, this is $264 million higher than a year ago. Adjusted EBITDA was $506 million, which is 52% higher than Q4 of 2021. And we generated $455 million free cash flow. And this is 20% higher than Q4 2021. Now, during the quarter, we saw a number of positive business trends. First, guest demand on Airbnb remains strong. Nights and experiences booked increased 20% in Q4. We had our highest number of active bookers ever in Q4, demonstrating guests' excitement to travel on Airbnb despite evolving macroeconomic uncertainties. During the quarter, we also continued to see guests booking trips further in advance, supporting a strong backlog for Q1. Second, guests are increasingly returning to cities and crossing border. And this is the bread and butter of Airbnb before the pandemic. Now, both segments continue to accelerate, while non-urban and domestic travel remain strong. Cross-border gross nights booked increased 49% compared to last year. High-density urban nights grew 22%. And globally, we saw cross-border travel to all regions increase despite continued foreign currency volatility. Third, guests continue to book longer stays on Airbnb. During Q4, Long-term stays remain stable from a year ago at 21% of total gross nights booked on Airbnb. And finally, we saw tremendous growth in our supply on Airbnb. We ended 2022 with 6.6 million active listings. Now, excluding all the mainland China listings we removed in July, we grew supply by 900,000 listings, or 16% compared to a year ago, representing an acceleration in growth in listings relative to Q3. Now, why are listings accelerating in growth? Uh, we believe there's probably two factors that drove this growth. First, demand drives supply. Hosts are attracted to supplemental income that they can earn on Airbnb, which is often critical during tough times. Second, our product improvements are working. Over the past two years, we've made it more attractive and easier to become a host. Just this past November, we introduced Airbnb Setup, where prospective hosts can connect with Superhost for free one-to-one -one guidance all the way through their first reservation. The number of new active hosts recruited with the help of our Superhost increased by more than 20% compared to pre-launch. But we are not stopping there. In 2023, we're focused on three strategic priorities. First, we want to make hosting mainstream. If you're listening to this call, you've likely traveled in Airbnb or you know someone who has. We want hosting on Airbnb to be just as popular. And to achieve this, we'll continue to raise awareness around hosting, make it easier to get started, and provide even better tools for hosts. Second, we are perfecting our core service. We want people to love our service. And that means obsessing over every single detail. And we've listened to our host and guest, and based on their feedback, we're making a large number of upgrades to our service this year, including improving customer service, making it easier to find the right home, and delivering greater value, and much, much more. And you'll see more of this in, um, in, the, forthcoming, in the coming months, especially our summer release. And finally, third, we're expanding beyond the core. You know, we have some pretty big ideas for where to take Airbnb next. And this year, we're going to build the foundation for future products and services that will provide in incremental growth for many years to come. So with that, Dave and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. We ask today that you limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Thank you. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question today comes from the line of Jed Kelly with Oppenheimer. Your line is now open. Hey, great. Um, thanks for taking my questions. Um, great quarter and, and great execution. Um, two, just two, if I may, just one 
Can you talk about how your urban supply is trending and sort of some of the initiatives you're doing around apartments? And then, Brian, you did mention, you know, headcount. You know, in Silicon Valley, there's obviously a lot of layoffs. You're one of the companies that are growing, having expanding margins. So can you talk about, like, your ability to attract top tech talent to execute on some of the initiatives you just talked about? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so um, let's start with the, the first one, urban supply uh, growth. Um, let me kind of first start, Jed, by just talking a little bit more about how we think about supply. The great thing about our supply is that the vast majority of hosts that come to Airbnb come organically, and that's because of our global network. In fact, the number one source of hosts are prior guests, and in Q4, 36% of our hosts were prior guests. And one of the other things we see is the fastest growing markets where we have supply is also the fastest growing markets where we have demand. And I think what's happening is a lot of our hosts are regular people. And as they get more bookings, they tend to tell their friends. And so this network is something that has a kind of self-growing effect to it. Now, in addition to that, we've been doing a number of initiatives. Um, number one, we've been focused to make hosting easier with Airbnb setup. And between that, and a new campaign we've been running, Jed, called Airbnb, it, which is basically this idea that if you have a space, you have an Airbnb. Between these two initiatives, we've seen twice the num amount of traffic to our host landing page. This is a landing page to learn about hosting. Um, and then we also have made big improvements to making hosting easier. Now, in addition, you might have seen that um, last November, we announced a new initiative called Airbnb Friendly Apartments. Airbnb Friendly Apartments, I think, can unlock a large amount of inventory in multifamily homes in urban areas. And we worked with Graystar and a number of the other largest real estate developers in the United States. We have 175 buildings in Phoenix and Jacksonville and Houston and other cities. And the response from landlords has been very, very positive. So we are seeing a lot of, tra a lot of traction on um, urban supply. I don't, Dave, you wanna add anything before I talk about headcount? Yeah, you, you, know, you covered it really well because this has been historic strength of ours has been kind of the urban part of the business. It's taken longer for that to kind of recover. It's now well above 2019 rates and it's actually part of the areas that accelerated our growth during the Q4. So we're very happy with where we're at with urban. And as Brian said, the early days of Airbnb friendly apartments has been uh, very well adopted and we're excited about the potential of that part of the business. And on, just on your question, Jed, on headcount, um, Something was really interesting happened. So obviously in 2020, we had to make some really difficult decisions and we became a much smaller and more focused company. And the obvious result of that is that we got more efficient and more profitable, but there was a less obvious result. What ended up happening is we had fewer people in meetings and people can move a lot faster. And we concentrated all of our very best people and put them on only a few problems. And I think that's been an explanation for why the company's grown really quickly. But also, I think it's made us a much more attractive place to work because it's much easier to get work done. And we have a general philosophy that we want the very best people in every field to come to Airbnb in every function. We're functionally organized. And I think that you know, we're one of the few tech companies that isn't you know, doing layoffs. We're not cutting, we're not freezing. We're actually stepping on the gas. But in our mind, stepping on the gas doesn't mean adding a huge amount of people we're going to continue to stay really lean, um, but we're, we're really focused on just really hiring in key positions. And we're, we, and again, I, I kind of use this analogy that we're not building like a giant Navy. It's more like the special forces. That's what we're focused on. So we've had a lot of success with talent. And of course, we're getting a lot of inbound. Thank and you. I had two couple, a couple things. One is, you know, our headcount is actually still 5% below where it was in 2019. And yet our revenue is 75% higher. So we're nearly twice as big as we were previously with fewer people. And I'd say another is our live and work anywhere approach, our approach to being very intentional about how we gather in person. We believe that actually working together in person is very important, just need to do it in a very coordinated way. So actually having people being back in the office on random days of the week is not very effective, but being in, doing it in a, a very controlled and planful way is uh, respectful of employees' time and is more efficient for the company. And our employees love it. And I think that's also enabling us to attract great talent. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Richard Clark with Stanford C. Bernstein. 
Your line is now open. Hi there. Yes, thanks for taking my questions. Um, yeah, two of them, A. The first one, just around, I guess, some of the changes that might come over the coming years with regard to the distribution landscape. Uh, one of your rivals is going to wrap their, their, their uh, vacation rental business into a loyalty program. Lots of talk around conversational AI and what that can do to the uh, distribution landscape. So just any comments whether you know, Airbnb needs to do anything further on the distribution platform. Um, and then second one, a little bit more prosaic, but obviously it looks like Q4 was a very good quarter for take rate. Um, have you done anything particular there on take rate uh, to, to, to achieve that result? Thank you. Um, Dave, you want to start with um, take rate and I'll then end with distribution platform? Yeah, with take rate, there's nothing in particular that we've done with take rate. The absolute, on a time adjusted basis, the um, amount that we take from each night's day has been very stable. And so any variation in take rate of revenue over gross booking value is just variation uh, quarter to quarter. So um, nothing on take rate. And, and maybe, um, Richard, just if I. Um, can you just clarify what you mean by distribution landscape? Do you mean like the competitive environment or how we yeah, get the, demand? Yeah, the competitive landscape, you get a competitive environment with regard to distribution, whether you see any threat or increased threat from a loyalty program wrapping around your competitors and, and, and maybe the, the conversational IR, AI that's uh, coming into various other uh, search platforms at the moment. No, I mean, like, I think there's just two things. On the competitive front, I mean, we have a lot of competitors and a lot of different categories, but I think Airbnb kind of stands in a class of its own. I mean, we're a noun and a verb used all over the world. Um, we're not just a U.S. business. We're not just a European business. We're a global business. We're not just vacation rentals. We're also urban and crowded border and off the grid. We're known as an affordable way to travel, but we also have a luxe offering and everything in between. Um, so, you know, I think we have a pretty unique offering. And I think ultimately, you know, 90% of our traffic comes direct. And that's because we have something that's unique. Uh, the vast majority of our homes don't exist anywhere else. And what we're really just focused on doing is we're obsessing over providing the very best experience for guests. And if we do that and we perfect that experience and then we do really great marketing, I think we'll do quite well. The only other thing I'll say, Richard, on the, the distribution front is we have some unique assets that most other travel brands don't have. Let's take PR. Um, there were 600,000 articles written about Airbnb last year. Airbnb is on social media a lot, and a lot of people are talking about Airbnb on social media. So we generally have a slightly different approach to distribution, where we think just continually innovating on our product is great. The best loyalty program is building a product people love so much they want to come back, and you don't have to pay them to come back. And we just take a full funnel approach to marketing around um, you know, PR, and we think of our general advertising as really educating people on new products. Now, as far as the changing landscape for technology, um, I'm actually very excited about, um, uh, about the possibilities of AI. I think Airbnb will uniquely benefit from this. And the reason why is because Airbnb is a fairly difficult product challenge, which is unlike hotels, we don't have SKUs. There's no representative inventory. Every single one of our 6.6 .6 million listings are unique. Um, guests left more than 100 million reviews last year, and to parse through all these reviews is very laborious. And I think that AI is going to really benefit our long tail of data and the fact that our search problem isn't really a search problem so much as a matching problem, right? If there's like 50,000 homes in a city, what's the right one for you? That's less of a search problem than a matching problem. And I think that AI is going to be a really great opportunity for us. And just stay tuned for some developments there. That's great. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from the line of Ron Josie with City. Your line is now great, open. Thanks. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Brian, you mentioned you know investments for 2023 and expanding beyond the core. That, that's been a key question that we consistently get in terms of what's next. And any insights you can provide there would be helpful. Maybe just is it building out the tech infrastructure or is it more sort of newer products that are coming down the pike? And, and then um, I believe in the letter we talked about 1.4 billion cumulative guest arrivals. And so I was wondering if you can talk more about the brand, the awareness overall, and, and just that, that user mix in terms of returning users versus newer users. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Um, well, let me, yeah, let me start with investments for 2023. So the good news is that um, though we're investing this year in some new products and services to expand beyond the core, 
um, I don't think you're going to see any material changes to the PNL. Um, we kind of think, you know, like I started me and my two friends. We didn't have any very many resources back then. And the great thing about Airbnb's business is we're essentially a global network. So I think that we can incubate new opportunities, products, and services for you know relatively low amount of investment. You know, um, and as far as what you're going to see, um, I'd say there's going to be innovations on the guest and host side. Um, on the host side, you know, we, our general principle is that we want to always deliver more value for hosts than we're charging. And we have a 3% take rate on the host side. And we've been giving away a lot of products for free, like AirCover. And we launched AirCover for host um, two Novembers ago. Um, NPS for claims, reimbursement claims, has gone up 70 points. So it's been pretty amazing. And our general view on host are we're going to primarily give away most of our products, services, and innovation to them. But we do think there's some opportunities for uh, ecosystem of services that hosts might pay for. On the guest side, we started very modestly. You might have seen that we launched travel insurance, which is now in eight countries, and that's been really, really successful. But I think there's many more uh, op opportunities uh, around the like services. Um, you know, obviously, Airbnb experiences is something that we're beginning to really ramp up, um, and I think you're going to see a lot more traction in that product in the coming years. And, um, you know, I think there's going to be just a lot more around um, creating a step change in new service level and matching people to the right homes and experiences for them. So that's what I would say. Um, services on the host side, service on the guest side. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to revisit some of the end-to-end -end travel opportunities that we have. And you'll stay tuned for some cool innovations. Oh, and sorry, on, and on the brand awareness, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, brand awareness. Um, you know, on the brand awareness, um, you know, again, we generally try to, as I said the last part, um, we generally focus on a full funnel approach. Um, you know, 90% of our traffic is now direct. It's sustained that since we went public. It's always been about 90%. We have extremely high uh, efficiency on things like performance marketing. And generally, the way we approach our brand is that Airbnb is a pretty ubiquitous brand. So what we really want to do now is continue to invest in awareness around our different innovations. And there are going to be two things. Number one, we're going to be focused on um, in, in, uh, educating people on our new services and offerings. So for example, Airbnb categories, we've been running campaigns around that. And people have viewed 500 million, uh, people viewed listings 500 million times through Airbnb categories. We're also continuing to raise awareness around hosting. You know, we're going to grow as fast as we have hosts. Now, as far as um, you know, how much traffic is coming from new returning, I don't know if Dave, you want to share anything about that or where a brand is. Yeah, I mean, the, the majority of our bookings come from past guests, and it's actually been the strong guest retention that we've had over years since the beginning of Airbnb that's been a powerful driver of our growth. Um, but I think what's also interesting is that we've introduced Airbnb to millions of new users since COVID, and the performance of those new users, the, the um, booking frequency of those new users from 21 in, that we saw into 22 has been very strong. And uh, so really pleased with the new users that we've been able to attract that look very, very similar to the historic type of users that we've had on Airbnb. Great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Mahaney with Evercore. Your line is now open. Okay, two questions, please. I know you mentioned that guest to host ratio. I think you said something like 36% or something. I imagine you've got cohort data that shows that, um, uh, that the percentage of guests that have converted into being hosts or additionally are host is actually higher, uh, much, maybe much higher. Could you just qualify that or quantify that at all? I'm sure that's a pipeline, but just how robust is that pipeline when you look at the cohort data? And then just very briefly on China, um, just on the China outbound, you just, can you just remind us uh, um, how material that was to your business back when, you know, back in 2019 so we can get a sense of, I know you've said that the China outbound market will gradually reopen, but as it fully reopens, how much of an opportunity that is for you? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll start, Mark. Um, yeah, we've seen that a third in Q4 uh, 2022, 36% of new available hosts who started out as guests in Airbnb, um, this is more than prior years. So this has been going up actually like year over year. Um, so that, that, that number is going up. And it kind of makes sense um, as Airbnb becomes more ubiquitous, but also it makes sense because a lot of people, they'll connect with a host and they'll realize, wow, I could do this too. And the vast majority of our new listings 
are by individuals, not property managers. So there's this kind of interesting network effect where guests become host and then hosts become guest. Um, as far as China, you know, um, we expect a recovery to be pretty gradual in China. You know, we think the big prize in China is the outbound business. Um, we think that there are going to be hundreds of millions of people that want to leave China to travel the world. And we think Airbnb is going to be the best way for essentially Gen Z people to travel. You know, they, they, I think they really want an authentic experience when they're traveling around the world. That being said, we are expecting a pretty gradual recovery in China. And China kind of pre, you know, pre COVID was in the kind of low, low single digit percentage of our you know, gross booking value. So it gives you some perspective of our opportunity. I think we think very often, you know, could be large over an extended period of time, but it will take a while for it to be larger. And so Mark, thanks, one other Dave, thing thanks, is, um, just, and just one other thing is, yeah, you are right that the um, cohorts are trending up. So for example, I think in Q4 2021, 33% of guests became hosts. In 2020, 28%. In 2019, 23%. So it is ticking up. Yes, that's good. That's cool. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Your next question comes from the line of Brian Nowak with Morgan Stanley. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks for taking my questions. I have two. Just the first one, and this is a lot of talk about guests and hosts. Could you just sort of um, help us understand a little bit how fast did your new guests grow in, in 2022? And how are you thinking about sort of new guest growth in 23? Did you sort of talk about EBITDA margins or what's your, what's your first cut at how fast guests could grow this year? And then the second one, just any update on um, metrics or quantifying adoption around I'm flexible or any of the other tools that you've rolled out to sort of better improve the, the load balancing between supply and demand? Great. Yeah, Dave, you want to? Yeah. No, sure. Um, you know, on the new guests, we don't disclose the exact number of the, um, you know, new guest growth. Like I said, I think the thing that I'm really pleased is that we've introduced Airbnb to millions of new guests since, uh, since COVID and that they're performing, you know, similarly, if not even stronger than kind of historic uh, guests in terms of their rebooking rates. So I feel really good about um, the position we have for, for new guests. A big piece of it is some of the brand marketing that Brian kind of mentioned earlier is just making sure we have a lot of awareness of Airbnb, but just to also make sure that we're getting strong consideration of Airbnb as a true option um, for them. And again, in this you know last several years, we've been able to introduce Airbnb to millions of, of new people that might not have thought about uh, trying us before. So I think that's been really helpful. Um, and don't have a, a lot to say on I'm flexible, except that we have very strong you know, adoption of the feature that, and we think that it's a, a, a great way for us to distribute, you know, demand to where we have supply. Um, and the flexibility features are, you know, a, a key benefit for um, Airbnb because we have this more difficult problem that Brian mentioned earlier of matching and trying to match the right guest to the right host. And the I'm flexible gives us the ability to do a better matching. Yeah, and one of the things I'll just say, um, Brian, is that we've seen a permanent like shift in some of the travel booking behaviors on Airbnb since before the pandemic, and a lot of those changes have endured. Um, and probably one of the most pronounced ones is it just is incremental flexibility for people. We noticed more people are searching uh, with more locations and using more flexibility features. And even before we built these features, we were seeing people entering a lot of different date variations um, when they were searching. And so we were just really responding to where things are going. And I think where this goes down the road is there's always gonna be business travelers and families that know exactly where they wanna go and when they wanna go. But I think the long-term game here is increasingly, you know, we're in 100,000 markets, people have not heard of 100,000 places. So the name of the game is pointing demand to where we have available supply. And that's kind of a big part of our product strategy. Great, thank you both. Your next question comes from the line of Lee Horowitz with Deutsche Bank. Your mm -hmm. line is now open. Great, thanks. So uh, maybe on ADRs, you, know, you guys continue to surpass expectations with FX neutral growth that you know, probably came in the quarter at a, a mid-single digits uh, up year on year. We we'll appreciate that looking at the 23 pricing initiatives and mix will impact your ability to grow. 
Um, but, you know, we've seen underlying pricing continue to offset these mix impacts. So when you think about 2023, you know, why can't ABRs grow again, given the strength of the overall industry um, you know, is, is supportive of, of pricing for you guys? Yeah, thanks, thanks on the ADRs. I mean, yeah, we were um, pleasantly, you know, there's two edges of the ADR. ADRs were up 5% year over year in Q4, excluding the impact of foreign exchange. Obviously, foreign exchange uh, brings it down to kind of, you know, minus 1% when you bring back nights that come, say, from Euro or uh, GBP uh, den uh, denominated nights. Um, and what we forecasted for the going forward is modest decline year over year in ADRs largely driven by changes in mix, right? People going back to cities, you know, cities are accelerating, more cross-border travel mixed towards lower ADR regions. You know, so it's, it's a double-edged sword. Clearly for the financials, it's helpful to have the higher AD rate, ADR rates because they drive greater revenue, greater flow through, and greater profitability. But obviously also ADRs are 36% higher than they were in 2019. So it's more expensive for guests to stay on Airbnb and frankly other places. I think the benefit that we've had is that even while ADRs are higher, we're providing great value, right? The ADRs, um, you know, on Airbnb still can provide a great location, you know, maybe a fully stocked kitchen, a washer and dryer, all the reasons why you might want to stay in Airbnb versus other alternatives. Um, and so as we look forward in the year, we just want to make sure that we continue to provide great value to our guests. And that's why we're building some of the tools that you know, Brian's talked about, which are things like giving tools to hosts to make sure that they understand the prices that guests are paying and making sure that they are providing, continue to provide great value to, to guests. So um, then the other thing we're doing is even as ADRs might come down modestly through the year through largely through mix, you know, and maybe some through pricing, it's just making sure that we're being really rigorous in our cost structure to kind of support declining ADRs, which is why we anticipate our EBITDA margins for the full year to be roughly the same as 2022, in that the headwinds from lower ADR rates will be offset by our efficiencies that we kind of drive internally. Um, Great, thanks, Helpful. And maybe one follow-up on supply, if I could. Um, clearly, the product initiatives are driving impressive supply growth as evidenced by the accelerator rates that you guys are, are showing at this point. When I think about how that plays through into 2023, is there anything that we should be thinking about that can keep you from maintaining at these elevated rates, um, you know, particularly given the fact that you will continue to iterate on the supply funnel to, to make it easier for hosts to come to the platform? Yeah, very proud of the continued growth in our supply. And, and we highlight it in the, the letter because it's, it's super important that we do our best to get a, have a balanced marketplace, right? If we get too much supply too quickly, then hosts aren't happy because they're not getting enough bookings. If we don't get enough supply early enough, then guests are not happy because they don't get the kind of selection they want. And actually what we highlight in the letter is that we have grown our supply by 26% since 2019. And yet our you know, nights and experiences booked have grown by 24%. So we've actually had a, a nice balance in that. And then, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that we've had 6.6 .6 million uh, active listings here in the last year and 900,000 more from the beginning of the year, which just shows the strength of Airbnb and why hosts want to come to where there is uh, demand. And then we're just making it easier for hosts um, to become hosts on Airbnb. So um, this will be a forever journey for us to, to keep providing supply where there is demand. And I think we've been doing it incredibly well for the last, you know, 10, 12 years, and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, and I think I think Leo just say like I think we're I think we're building a bit more of a muscle too around this, um, and I think it's been a really big focus of ours. So you know whether it's the product innovations, the awareness, focusing on even building uh, supply in key markets, I think it's been a really great muscle the team has built. Understood. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of John Colantuoni with Jeffries. Your line is now open. Hey, thanks for taking my questions. I uh, wanted to start with the new pricing and discounting tools that you're, you're rolling out. It sounds like uh, the expectation is that they're going to be sort of a net headwind to ADR. So can you just walk through uh, the strategic rationale for the new products? I assume it's about sort of improved customer experience, but it would be great to get your perspective on that. 
And, uh, and second, nights and experiences on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis in, in 4Q and 1Q seem to be back on trend with the, the historical seasonality we saw pre-pandemic. Is this sort of the right way to think about the trend in nights and experiences throughout the, the cadence of the year? Thanks. All right. Hey, John. Um, I'll start. Um, on pricing and discounts, let's just take a step back. Um, Airbnb, we started 15 years ago. And when we started, we started as an affordable alternative to hotels. And I think that affordability and great value is one of the key reasons that people use Airbnb. And we have to continue to make sure that we have that value. And as long as people feel like they have the best product at the best value for Airbnb, I think we're going to deliver a huge amount of growth in years to come. And so there's really three things that we're doing. The first thing is transparent pricing with, with, with all-in pricing display. Um, you know, in Europe, in many countries around the world, we actually do show total price. But in the United States, the convention for travel companies show a low base rate. And then when you get to checkout, there's additional fees. But we spent a lot of time listening to our guests and hosts, and we've heard from our guests. Um, it's not, not, you know, that a lot of them want to be able to see the total price up front. And so we spent a bunch of time in December. We rolled out total pricing, includes all fees before taxes. Since we've rolled it out, the impact on our bookings has been neutral. Now, I know there was a lot of, you know, we, we didn't, you know, there was a lot of speculation around what happened to show up on pricing. But I think that the response has been very positive. And we chose a very specific implementation. And the implementation we chose was a price toggle where you can turn it on or off. The basic idea is give people the control of how they want to see prices, but also the act of turning the toggle on helps people understand why our prices are changing and why they might be displayed different than competitors. So again, the impact has been neutral on bookings in the short run, but I actually think the impact on bookings in the long run is going to be very positive because it's just a better experience and it gives people more control. Um, the second thing is we are now prioritizing better value listings in search results. So in other words, we're going to take the total price in um, the total price into account when we're prioritizing bookings. And then the third thing we're going to be doing is we're building new tools, pricing tools for hosts, so that they understand the final price that they're showing to guests. One of the things we learn when we talk to hosts is they don't always know the final price guests are paying. And if they did, they'd modulate some of the fees. I think in the short run, it may have some modest impacts on ADR, but in the long run, I think what it's going to do is drive a lot more demand to Airbnb. I don't know if Dave, you want to add anything or take the second question. Um, no, I think you, you hit on all the key points on ADR. You know, we're not anticipating a significant decrease in ADR as a result of these pricing tools. We just want to make sure that we're being transparent and helping hosts make sure that they're setting prices that are appropriate for their listings. So um, I think that on the nights and experiences, trends, um, I, we're finally beginning to reach a point where the year-over-year -year comparisons are much more consistent. And so I think, uh, you know, 2023 won't look exactly like 2022, but it's a much better guide than kind of historic years. So we are getting back to, um, you'd be able to use year-over-year -year as a trend line for your forecasting. Your next question comes from the line of Mario Liu with Barclays. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks for taking questions. Uh, first one is on the listings growth number, the 900,000 year year. I was wondering if you could help break down that number further. For example, you know, were most of these listings completely new listings uh, or were, you know, a good portion of it reactivated ones, say, in urban areas? Um, just trying to see how this growth is organic versus travel normalizing. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the way to think about listings is think about how all listings work. In, in any given year, we have brand new listings, we have reactivated listings, and then we have deactivated listings and some combination of each of those three. I'd say that the trends of each of those um, have been kind of up and to the right. In other words, I think we've showing uh, improvement in fewer deactivations and strengthening of our new activations. And so the sum total of each of those is all contributing towards our growth. Um, but I don't have any other more specific breakout to give to you. Um, I mean, I think the other, maybe the only other highlight I would give is it wasn't in just kind of one region. Like we were seeing broad-based growth of listings around the world 
and then even by listing type. It was like one of the earlier questions about how is listing growth around urban. You know, again, and urban was one of the accelerating areas. So you see really nice growth in the urban where that comes back. It, it just leads back to this marketplace dynamic that we, we have for Airbnb, which is we both work hard to get listings proactively on our own and get them more organically where there's demand. And where there's not demand, that's also where you'll see deactivations or fewer listing growth. It, it tends to be self-healing over time. Great. Thanks, Dave. And the second one is on the lead time for bookings. Uh, in your outlook, you mentioned uh, Europeans were booking summer travel earlier this year. Uh, so any, any commentary you can provide on just globally how lead times look thus far versus pre-pandemic and you know, any puts and takes to consider when thinking about if the 20% room night growth is sustainable for the rest of the year? Thanks. Yeah, I, we're really pleased with the European lead times coming up. You know, Europeans will tend to book their summer travel here in the beginning of the year and um, to see them booking even earlier on Airbnb relative to our historic rates has been really great to see. Just, I think, shows the optimism that they have for kind of travel um, this summer. And, and then broad-based, uh, we are just seeing a slightly longer uh, lead time more generally across Airbnb overall. So again, I just think that shows uh, a nice optimism for people feeling confident that they can um, book for their summer travel season. Um, so I, I think I don't have yeah, much more to say than that. All right, thank you. Thank Thanks. You. As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question. Your next question comes from the line of Justin Post with Bank of America. Your line is now open. Great. Um, I, I think you give it in a K, but can you give us the mix of Asia in, in 22? I don't know if you can now. And then secondly, how do you think about the Asia recovery and China cross-border uh, impacting uh, results over the next 12 months? Thanks. Yeah, the, you know, in the next 12 months, Asia is still recovering, right? Asia has still been down versus 2022, I mean, 2019. And, uh, but they were the fastest kind of growing region in the fourth quarter. So we think it's um, pretty optimistic about the opportunity. And as Brian even mentioned about China, like the long-term outlook for, for example, Chinese outbound travelers is something that we feel very bullish on for over the long term. And in terms of the fourth quarter, um, APAC was a 12% of the business in the fourth quarter. Thank you. And I'll, maybe I'll just, I'll just say that I think that Asia Pacific is a huge growth area for us going forward. And it's been a little bit of a slower recovery. And I think the reason why is Asia is um, historically more of a cross-border market. A lot of people in Asia basically travel across countries. They don't have as big of a domestic market in any of these countries for the most part. And that's just been a slower recovery. But I think the one thing we've seen is that just means probably more pent up demand and Asia index is even higher on Gen Z travelers, which is a strong suit of Airbnb. So we're really bullish over the next few years on Asia. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Lloyd Walmsley with UBS. Your line is now open. Hi, thanks for taking the question. This is Chris on for Lloyd. Um, just can you start by helping us think about the range of outcomes for ADRs in the 1Q23 uh, guide? I guess as, as we kind of lay out your guidance saying that take rates would be very similar to 1Q22 levels and get you to, say, 20.7 billion potentially of gross bookings in 1Q23, and you assume maybe a slight decel on room nights. I could get to a situation where ADRs are potentially flat to better. I guess is you're talking to ADRs being down slightly on a year over year basis. I guess is what would need to happen here for ADRs to be flat, uh, flat to better on a year over year basis in one Q? Well, to be um, flat to better would be if there's you know stronger overall just pricing, and if the mix came in differently. For example, you know maybe um, urban didn't come in quite as strong as or cross border, you know Latin America, Asia didn't come in quite as strong. So a lot of our ADR forecast for Q1 comes from the anticipated continued growth of urban 
cross-border and regional mix. And, and that's why we're forecasting it down for, you know, in the just down slightly year over year. Um, you know, the implied take rate, it, it should be directionally the same as last year, and you know, maybe not precisely the same, but I think um, it, I think you look back at 2022 and it'll be a good guide for your take rate. Okay, got it. And just maybe one quick follow-up question on, on the product side, as you guys are talking about um, really kind of expansion opportunities, how should we be thinking about hotel within that? Is, or should we be thinking about more of the expansion opportunities being related to the core business and, and experiences in 23? Um, Chris, I would just say, uh, I mean, all the above, you know, um, I think hotels are important ways to fill a network gap. So I think people come to Airbnb because we have something unique they can't get anywhere else, but we also have a huge amount of traffic. And so we want to make sure people come to Airbnb, they don't leave without finding something. So I think you can think about our product uh, a few ways. Number one, our core business has a huge amount of growth ahead of us. And so we just want to first perfect the core experience by making it easier to find the right Airbnb, um, providing better service um, each step of the way, and providing better value. Next, we have a lot of emerging use cases. Those emerging use cases are longer stays, obviously, which is more than a fifth of our nights booked. Um, you know, we also have experiences that we're really focused on and continuing to fill out our network gaps. And then finally, beyond just all those are obviously new products and services over the horizon. So we kind of have a very balanced portfolio of all of the above. Okay, got it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Kevin Copeman with Cowan. Your line is now open. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so a quick one, uh, given you have 10 billion in cash on the balance sheet and, and generated 3 billion in cash flow last year, not including the funds held on behalf of guests, can you just give us an update how you're thinking about capital allocation um, and share repurchases? And do you see a potential for repur uh, repurchases to go beyond offsetting stock comp? Thanks. Yeah, I'm mean, really pleased with our you know, cash position, right? We ended with $9.6 billion of cash of, um, on the balance sheet at the end of the year. That is after buying back $1.5 in stock. We, we have $500 million left on the existing um, you know, repurchase approval. Uh, and we anticipate that will be executing early in the year, you know, but clearly we're also in still in growth mode. Like we are using this balance sheet to make sure that we can invest in growth for the business in the future. Clearly keep enough cash for potential M&A opportunities, which could exist. Um, and then, you know, to the extent that we can return stock, you know, cash to shareholders through share repurchases, that, that'll be our primary vehicle you would anticipate this year. We're going to have about a billion dollars of stock-based compensation. You know, we'll at least be offsetting that through share repurchases. And um, but I don't have anything more to say beyond that at this time. But we'll continue to evaluate uh, what the appropriate amount of cash is to keep and how much we should continue to return to shareholders. But um, remember, we are still heavily in growth mode. We are we want to be able to invest in the long-term growth of this business. Thanks, Dave. Your next question comes from the line of Stephen Drew with Credit Suisse. Your line is now open. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so can you talk about the typical behavior from the new hosts when they're onboarded? Um, do they start making only a small number of days available and as time goes on and they get more comfortable with hosting, uh, they maybe make more time slots available uh, throughout the course of the year? Because it seems like we're all completely preoccupied with the total host number. Because honestly, that's the only number that's disclosed. But I'm wondering if the aggregate availability growth has, has historically been a number that's been much higher uh, than the property or host growth. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Stephen. I can I can start. Um, the general trend we see is that most people come to Airbnb with uh, kind of uh, more casual intent to host occasionally. Sometimes people come to Airbnb to host on a one-off basis. For example. Um, this past weekend in Phoenix, we saw a really big surge of new listings for Super Bowl. Um, what we noticed is that over time, hosts generally increase the number of days available, and they tend to get more productive every year. Um, and so more and more nights get booked on a single listing. And then we also see a number of hosts add a second, third, or fourth listing, depending upon what markets they're in. So the general idea is that hosts get more productive. They eventually book more nights. Um, 
They, their ADR typically goes up as they accumulate more reviews. One of the things we recommend new hosts do is when they don't have reviews to start a little bit more affordably. And then as they accumulate great reviews, they can command a little bit higher uh, kind of market pricing. And so those are the general trends we see. A general in uptick in uh, ADR is to get more reviews and build a reputation. They add more nights. And then occasionally you'll see some people add additional listings, depending upon the kind of segment they're in. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Doug Anmuth with J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, I just wanted to circle back yeah. on your comments on EBITDA margins for 23. You talked about maintaining margins um, with the variable cost efficiencies kind of being the offset to, to lower ADRs. Just walk us through a little bit more on those uh, cost efficiencies um, that you're thinking about. And then kind of related, how should we think about marketing? Spending sounds like you're going to shift more of the brand into one queue. And is that just driven by a, a pull forward in in bookings, or or more of just a shift in your strategy? Thanks. Yeah, the uh, way we anticipate our EBITDA margins for this year is that one of the headwinds is this anticipated ADR decline that we talked about earlier on the call, and that the way in which we are going to be able to offset the margin impact of those declines will be through fixed cost discipline. You know, we're going to continue to grow, but we're going to grow modestly. So think of our headcount growth being in the, you know, two, three, four percent range. Um, so we'll keep keep having very good fixed cost discipline. Uh, we've already, I'll address marketing in a minute, but because we've already um, addressed a lot of the marketing reductions, but we're just seeing strong improvements in our variable cost reductions as well. Everything from community support costs, cost of payments costs, infrastructure costs, um, you know, all those areas are just important and ongoing efforts for us to drive profitability. As I mentioned earlier, we're still in heavy growth mode. I am not in profit maximization mode. I have a long list of things that we can invest in to drive further profitability. But I know that I can also afford, uh, with our headcount growth, profitability improvements that can offset the ADR declines. And that's what we'll be uh, investing in this year. And then, you know, we can keep working on the other variable cost improvements uh, over time. And then in terms of marketing, we've had the major step change uh, reduction in our marketing expense. That was actually a strategic change all the way back in 2019 that's proven to be incredibly effective from 2020 all the way through 2022. And what we'd see in 2023 is that marketing costs as a percentage of revenue for the full year will be about the same as what it was in 2022. But what we are doing is shifting some of the timing. We're, we're just getting even earlier in the year to make sure that we're getting our message out to guests all, all around the uh, world so that they're ready to kind of make their bookings for kind of peak summer travel season, which is in the summer. And so I think it's just we're getting more efficient and effective at the timing, and we think bringing forward a little bit more marketing into Q1 is a more effective use of our dollars. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Nick Jones with JMP Securities. Your line is now open. Great. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, can I go back to uh, kind of the Airbnb-friendly apartments? Um, what does it look like to get property managers on board with this, and I guess how much of the apartments that they're managing start to get unlocked? And I guess what kind of runway do you see in these key markets to, to add on kind of meaningfully more property managers? Thanks. Yeah, I, I can start, Nick. Um, so yeah, I mean, this new program is something that we developed because actually we started getting a lot of inbound from real estate developers. And they started, uh, you know, we started saying, you know, if we made our buildings Airbnb friendly, would it make the building more appealing, especially to young people that are moving to markets uh, certain certain cities? And so we did a partnership. Um, we started with working with Graystar Equity Residential, uh, over ten other companies, and we've launched. We have 175 buildings in like Houston, Phoenix, Jacksonville, um, and the vast majority of these units are kind of. A, we expect if they were put on Airbnb, they would be a typical kind of ADR. They're usually one bedrooms and studios. Um, you know the tenants sign a sublease um, to a fixed number of days a year they can rent, typically less than 180 days. So the whole idea is these are people's primary homes and they rent them when they're gone. And you know, I think we're gonna get a lot of demand because there's a lot of benefits to, to landlords. Number one, a landlord gets visibility control around who's doing what in their building. Number two, they get a lot of free demand 
of people that want to lease their apartments. And three, they get a cut on the uh, Airbnb uh, on the commission. Um, so based on what we're seeing, there's been a lot of positive word of mouth. Um, many REITs and developers are engaging with Airbnb. We're, we think we're going to be able to send a lot of traffic to them. And so I think this is a program that's going to grow quite a lot. And I also think why it's strategic to us beyond all the incremental apartments that it unlocks is we're now developing relationships with many of the biggest landlords in the United States. And if that happens, I think you're going to see leases generally being more friendly to Airbnb. Great. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Bernie McTurnan with Needham. Your line is now open. Great. Thank you for taking the questions. Um, <clears throat> on margin, so um, two impacts on, on EDRs, the mix shift and the pricing. It sounds like mix shift is contemplated in that flat um, EBITDA margin guide for 23, but can you still achieve flat EBITDA margins if that pricing benefit does come out um, modestly of ADRs? And, and as a follow-up, just if there's an estimate for how much FX weighed on EBITDA margins in 22, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, on the two impacts, I mean, as you said, large forecast that we have for ADR moderation is due to the mix shift. Clearly, we want to make sure that we are giving tools to host to price effectively so that we have great value. Um, we're not, it will, it will be, time will tell how much change we'll see in ADR from those overall changes. I do have you know, a fair amount of levers, as I said, over time that I can pull in order to continue to improve the cost efficiency. And if ADRs come down more, then I will need, may need to pull a few more levers, but I feel confident we can deliver our EBITDA margin uh, neutral in the face of whatever ADR headwinds that we uh, see this year. So I think that's the, the main um, end piece. And then your second question again? Oh, just if if there was an estimate for how much FX weighed on EBITDA margins this year, given the differential between where revenues are generated and where the costs are in the U.S. We maybe we can follow up offline on that. I mean, it was a material, you know, probably several hundred million dollars, but we'd have to give you the um, maybe we we'll work offline on a specific yep. calculation. Understood. Thank you. Great. Thanks for the call, Bernie. Your next question comes from the line of Tom White with DA Davidson. Your line is now open. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, any color or metrics you guys can provide on how cohorts of guests that you acquired during the, the height of the pandemic have been performing over the last several months, kind of relative to customers acquired pre-pandemic? I'm just curious whether, you know, it looks like there might be any meaningful differences when it comes to, I don't know, frequency, spend levels, repeat rates, uh, any, anything like that. No, the actual frequency take rate, no, spend rates have actually been very consistent with kind of pre-COVID um, acquired guests. So we feel really good about the new guests coming on and having them um, look very similar to historic guests. And so very consistent. Great, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Deepak Mathavanan with Wolf Research. Your line is now open. Right. Right. Thanks for taking the questions. Just a couple ones first. You now, uh, it's nice to see the supply growth, but can you talk about trends on the utilization side? I know uh, you don't look at occupancy in a traditional sense, but any color on how the product initiatives, like you know, the changing the search experience or I'm flexible from 2022, is kind of helping with you know utilization or occupancy on the platform. And then uh, second question, mix of long-term stays remains stable near 20%. Uh, how should we think about that for 2023? Is that you know, a potential opportunity and an area of focus for 2023? What, what sort of product initiatives can you do to kind of take that mix higher, given that it you know, obviously helps with the marketplace balance? Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Deepak. I, on the supply growth, I think the best measure to look at is you just look at the growth in supply that we had versus 2019 that, you know, we grew at 26% and our nights and experiences book grew 24%, kind of largely in line. You know, we're, we're not seeing any major um, shifts in overall kind of utilization rate that um, give us any concern. We feel like we continue to keep in aggregate this nice balance of growing supply and growing demand, and we want to keep that relative balance. As I mentioned earlier in the call, if, if one gets out of whack too much, then either the hosts aren't happy or the, or the guests aren't happy. But I'm very um, pleased with the way in which we've been able to keep that balanced. 
And then in terms of long-term stays, I mean, if you actually rewind the tape all the way back to pre-COVID time, you know, Q1 of 2019, our long-term stays were about 13% of nights. By the end of the year, it was maybe 16% of nights, so, so think 13 to 16. You know, last year, it was kind of 19 to 21 or so, you know, 21%, obviously, in the fourth quarter. So it's been uh, elevated and fairly stable. I think what we see in Q1 this year is that we continue to see really strong growth in short-term stays and short-term stays kind of outpacing our growth a little bit in versus long-term stays here in the first quarter. So I anticipate it coming down just a little bit here in, in the first quarter on a mixed basis, but it's largely just driven by, you know, the short-term acceleration that we're seeing and it's still remaining significantly elevated over uh, 2019 rates. Got it. Thank you so much. That makes sense. Thank you. This concludes our Q&A session for today. I turn the call back over to Brian for closing remarks. All right, everyone, well, thank you for joining us today. Um, to recap, we had another record year in 2022. Revenue and adjusted EBITDA were both record highs, and free cash flow was $3.4 billion. You know, I'm really proud of these results. And before I go, I just want to say you know, how proud I am of our team. If you think about what we what this team has been through the last three years, initially losing 80% of our business, kind of rebuilding the company from the ground up, and now just becoming a much more focused, disciplined company, this is a lot of momentum inside the company. And looking forward, we're already seeing some really strong demand in Q1. Consumer confidence to travel remains really high. I think part of that is like, no matter what happens in the world, you know, people want to travel. You know, and for many people, the office is now Zoom, the mall is now Amazon, the theater is now Netflix, and so travel is going to become a very important way that people experience the world this year. And so therefore, this